The ultimate type of duplication that a genome can sustain is, of course, the duplication of the whole genome. In a diploid species, uh, in which each cell carries two copies of the genome, this will result in that species becoming tetraploid, with four copies of the entire genome in each somatic cell. This has happened during the course of evolution. Although it is something relatively common in plants, we also know of a few examples of tetraploid species in mammals. But the vast majority of mammals are diploid. However, even in diploid uh, animals, we have uh, remnants of whole genome duplications that took place in the past, at some point during evolution. The problem is that after the duplication of the whole genome, most of the new copies are redundant. There is no need to keep those extra copies. So they are lost and after a long time there will only be a few traces of the duplication. Even so, whole genome duplications can be inferred when several groups of genes are found duplicated as a block in different parts of a genome. For instance, the comparison of all genes against all genes in the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae revealed 55 groups of duplicated genes, each group including at least three genes in the same order. Uh, and in total, the 55 duplicated groups comprise uh, around half of the genome of the yeast. So this is supposed to be the result of a single duplication of the whole genome, followed by the loss of many duplicated fragments. This is a much more likely thing to happen than 55 independent duplications of genome segments. And actually, we, we compare the genome of uh, the two the, of this yeast with the genome to, of two of the yeast species. We can infer that such um, duplication took place in the genome of Saccharomyces cerevisiae less than 100 million years ago. Back in the 1960s, a scientist called Susumu Ono proposed that there had been two whole genome duplications in the genomes of the ancestors of modern vertebrates. This is known as Ono's 2R hypothesis. As genomes of various chordates have been sequenced in recent years, we can now, for the first time, look for some type of evidence, some traces of, of these events. Um, this is not easy because uh, many things have happened in the last 500 million years. But if we focus our search on very old genes, we can see some very interesting things. As I mentioned in the previous unit, hox genes are very ancient. It is not clear whether sponges and comb jellies have true Hox homologs, but they certainly contain genes that encode homeobox proteins. So these genes really date back to the diversification of the first animals. If you look at the genomes of modern tetrapods, animals with four limbs, we all have four copies of a cluster of 13 Hox genes. Not all four copies are identical, of course, because they lack different combinations of paralogs, but it is clear that they are the result of two duplications of one ancestral cluster, followed by loss of some members of the cluster independently in each of the four copies. And as I say, this is found in the genomes of all modern vertebrates, like humans and a mouse or some uh, types of fish even. And what is remarkable is that you see the same pattern, four Hox clusters in the genomes of most vertebrates with a jaw, whereas you only see two clusters in the genomes of jawless fish, like the lamprey. And Amphioxus, the branchiostoma, the lancelet, which has a knot cord, and therefore is a more distant relative of vertebrates, has just one Hox cluster, and the same happens with another primitive chordate, um, Zion intestinalis, the, the C squared. So these very old chordates have only one copy of the Hox cluster, just like the fly and invertebrates in general. This actually fits in quite well with Arno's hypothesis of two sequential whole genome duplications in the ancestors of vertebrates after the divergence from other chordates. One whole genome duplication probably took place around 560 million years ago when jawless fish diverged from the rest of vertebrates. That would explain that jawless fish have two clusters. And then the second duplication would have been about 530 million years ago. 
But this is not the end of the story, because if we consider the genomes of ray-finned fishes, known as actinopterygians, then we find evidence for a third whole genome duplication in the ancestor of this family of fish. Because the genomes of these fish have eight clusters of Hox genes. So the detailed analysis of Hox genes in all these animals provides an excellent reminder of the several whole genome duplications that probably took place in the genomes of vertebrates. Starting with a hypothetical ancestor about 530 million years ago that already had four Hox clusters, lobe-finned fishes like the Selacanth lost some of them, whereas the ancestor of tetrapods lost different combinations of paralogs in amphibians compared to other vertebrates. And then in the line leading to modern ray-finned fishes like the zebrafish or the puffish, there was a third whole genome duplication which resulted in eight Hox clusters with different types of gene laws in the various branches of this tree. Incredible, right? But uh, this is not all. Fish genomes still have a lot of information hidden in them, and we are just starting to solve some mysteries of evolution by sequencing genomes from different types of fish. Very recently, in January 2014, we could have a look at the sequence uh, of the first cartilaginous uh, fish, a shark, um, a bizarre type of shark known as the elephant shark. Sharks belong to a group of fish called chondrichthians because their, their backbone is made of cartilage instead of bone. The other major type of fish with bony skeletons are the osteichthians. Now, how such an evolutionary innovation has come about, you know, replacing cartilage with bone? Well, it's a still a bit of a mystery, but the genome of the elephant shark revealed that just a couple of duplication events might account for it. Comparing the genome of the elephant shark with the genomes of other types of fish, scientists found that the duplication of a gene called SPARC in the ancestor of sharks and bony fish gave rise to another gene called SPARC-L1. Then, only in the bony fish ancestor, a series of tandem duplications of SPARC-L1 created a new gene family known as SCPP, which is in fact responsible for bone formation. In fact, when scientists knocked down some of the genes belonging to this gene family into zebra fish, which is a type of bony fish, their skeletons actually lost bone. So as you see, all these lines of evidence add support to honors to our hypothesis. And I think that they also illustrate very beautifully how modern genomics can really help to test old hypotheses about evolution and open a window into what really may have happened at very crucial points in evolutionary history.